Good afternoon, good morning. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to host uh, this uh, session on uh, the foundations of global social cohesion. And uh, it's uh, the greatest pleasure to have uh, with me uh, Merike Blofield, uh, who is um, a professor at uh, the uh, at, in political science at the University of Hamburg, and uh, she also director of the Institute for Latin American Study Studies at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies, so called uh, GIGA. Uh, with us, uh, there is also uh, Andrew Percy, who is a co-chair of the Social Prosperity Network at the Institute for Global Prosperity, University College London. And uh, Andrew leads the IGP's work on the 21st century welfare and was also the lead author on the 2017 IGP report on uh, universal basic services. And the last but not least, we have uh, Tommaso Faccio, who is a lecturer in accounting at the Nottingham University Business School and the head of the Secretariat of the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation. So clearly when we devised this session, the uh, war in Ukraine, were still far from uh, being uh, occurring. And uh, of course, now we seem to be living in a different type of world from when uh, this session was uh, initially um, devised. And uh, of course, the, we can come up with the many different scenarios about the consequences of the war on uh, uh, global governance and uh, uh, globalization in general. It is, uh, of course, uh, quite to be expected that uh, globalization, so to speak, will suffer a retreat um, because, uh, because of the war. And uh, so that uh, talking about the idea of uh, a global notion of a social cohesion could be really uh, far-fetched uh, today. Um, and some political scientists are also talking about really the start of a new era uh, where uh, what has been called the peace dividend. So the fact that uh, a large relatively amount of uh, the uh, government budget could be, could be spent on uh, social welfare uh, rather than a military spending, well, this uh, peace dividend uh, might might uh, be evapor evaporated uh, for uh, a not too far away uh, future. But still, we would like uh, to um, talk about uh, social cohesion uh, in any case. And of course, one of the first things uh, that uh, we should do is uh, to understand better what uh, uh, social cohesion uh, is about. Uh, here in this session, we will not have time really to uh, go in depth uh, into the uh, foundations of social cohesion. So we'll have to kind of uh, appeal to an intuitive notion of a social cohesion as uh, the tendency for a community, for members of the community to interact with each other, to be connected with each other, and also to express uh, in a material way uh, solidarity to each other, and not only to do that in practical terms, but also in, uh, um, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, sub subjective feelings. So uh, uh, the notion of social cohesion include both uh, an objective aspect, of, but also a subjective aspect of a feeling connected uh, to the rest of the society, trusting uh, other people, but also um, institutions. And, uh, um, you know, if we want to find some silver lining from uh, the war, maybe we can think that uh, um, a, a consequence of the war might be to, of course, it's going to create a disruption at the global level, most likely, but uh, the, it, it, it is often the case that uh, the effect of war is uh, to uh, create uh, what is uh, what can be referred to as a more bonding social capital. So maybe what we'll observe is uh, a greater social cohesion, not at the global level, but at the, at the more regional level, for instance, at the European level or, or in uh, um, different uh, other um, territorial uh, areas. So yeah, uh, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. But uh, yes, after uh, this um, um, introduction to the session, I would like to ask uh, um, Andrew, 
who has uh, worked uh, extensively on the notion of uh, universal basic services. So you have also been active uh, at the T7 uh, level, so the think tank uh, 7 that is the network supporting the G7. So would you like to explain to uh, the audience uh, uh, what uh, this idea of a universe of, of universal basic services uh, is about uh, and uh, whether it can be uh, the extent to which it can be applied to an international setting thank you yeah I, uh, happily thank you Gianluca uh, I, I wish I shared your your idea of a silver lining uh, to this I think that what the loss of the peace dividend which is probably going to happen the sort of deglobalization are just exaggerating pressures that were already there from the energy transition. Um, and I think that um, we'll talk a little bit about how, you know, this applies uh, at a global level across different countries. But I think that one of the most significant effects is it reinforces uh, pressure on the G7 and uh, particularly all of the advanced countries to think about whether they are truly running sustainable welfare systems. Um, and I guess our approach is to think of social protection as a key part of social cohesion. Um, so we kind of approached it from the basis that, that if you understand what it takes to succeed in a modern society, it's actually a complex interaction between certain supports that all need to be in place you know, at a, at a, at a, you know, at one level, you can look at being a student and digital access. You could look at access to healthcare and the necessity of access to housing. You can look at uh, gender violence issues and uh, the access to housing. So there is a complex interaction here. And I think one of the things we wanted to do with universal basic services was step away from a sort of 20th century concept of social protection, which seem to kind of say, uh, you know, basically, we'll give you some money and, and you'll be able to, to figure out uh, how to turn that into social protection. Uh, when the reality of a lot of what makes up real social protection is collective infrastructure, people can't build their own hospitals, they can't build their own universities, these are collective systems that need to be in place. And I, I think we've come to kind of assume certain things uh, uh, as, uh, as being in existence and then kind of look at, at, at uh, extensions of that without paying attention to the really important role that public services and collective infrastructure pays. So, I mean, at the core of, of universal basic services is a pretty simple proposal, which says that the most effective way to deliver social protection and enhance social cohesion is through collective infrastructure that drives down the cost of living. So the primary kind of offset, you know, uh, uh, difference in that approach is to say, rather than trying to do monetary compensation to chase a set of costs which are being driven by a market, that there are a set of core basic needs that they're not really choices um, that need to be fulfilled in order for the human potential in any society to have a chance to, to flourish. Um, and so, we, you know, what we did is, is create seven basic categories that are completely, I think, uncontroversial, um, you know, shelter and food and healthcare and education. A couple of modern ones that we would add in, but I, I mean, I say modern, I mean, there are countries all over the world that are recognizing both of these, so digital access and access to public transport networks. Um, that those are essential glue in a modern society. You might not have thought of them in 1922, but in 2022, they're just essential. Uh, and so if we set up that basic needs, um, what is the best way of delivering that? That it actually you know, delivers on our objectives. And so when we say best, we mean that the highest quality of that kind of service that reaches the most people. And I think something that's come out of this T7 session is we need to move welfare if, if welfare or social protection is going to be part of social cohesion, it's not about some sort of, you know, minority adjustment for people right at the bottom of the thing. It's got to be a broader view, a universal set of very accessible services. And we're going to come on. I'm looking forward to, to talk a little bit about tax. And I think that kind of interrelates here. Um, so, you know, how, how do you make these kinds of things unconditionally 
uh, uh, available in order to improve their universal access? How do you deliver them efficiently given the interaction between all of them? Uh, and our conclusion at the end of that is, is you need a set of universal public services. So uh, that, that's, that's where we came to with universal basic services. And we've done a fair bit of modeling. You know, if you, if you look at them as public service infrastructure and you gain the advantage of them kind of working together under a single cohesive kind of political umbrella, like we know we want to build transport infrastructure that supports the healthcare system. Um, you, you, you create these uh, synergies and you get uh, um, a lot of cost benefits, reducing costs, and that these are very effective in reducing the cost of living and the distributional effect across the uh, deciles is very positive. Um, so I, hopefully that's, a, that's a, a decent introduction to universal basic services. I think that applies, you know, it applies very much in Western countries. I think the same model applies across others, although that's not my area of expertise. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Very comprehensive and also very ambitious uh, yeah. proposal. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. And also everyone is uh, free to uh, pose, uh, to ask questions in the chat and then we'll try to have a final round of a Q&A uh, at the end of the session. Uh, but before um, uh, going there, uh, let me ask uh, uh, Merike something more. So I suppose uh, one of the obstacles that you have to design in a notion of a global social cohesion is that people in different countries and coming from different cultures might have uh, different needs and also different preferences preferences uh, over what uh, uh, should be uh, guaranteed and what uh, should not be guaranteed. Or maybe we can really think of uh, uh, a universal set of needs that uh, should be and uh, uh, sh should be and would be addressed uh, in uh, different parts of the world. So uh, here I would like I would like to rely on uh, your uh, vast experience in uh, social cohesion and in social services provision, both in Latin America and uh, uh, Europe, and uh, ask you, yeah, what is your stance uh, on that? So do you think that uh, cultural differences are uh, large enough that um, uh, the notion of a global social cohesion is uh, somehow undermined? Uh, or do you think that there is a scope for having a um, so-called universal approach to, to, to the issue? Thank you. Um, so that is a very broad question. And so I'll try and answer it in some bite-sized pieces so I don't just resort to some like platitudes, right? Um, I, I do think, I mean, of course, the question you can ask is how do you define cultural differences? And I think this, and this is my opinion based very much on my uh, research in Latin America and Europe, and also in living, growing up in Europe, then living in uh, five different countries across the Americas. <clears throat> how do you define cultural differences? And a lot of what we think of as cultural differences. And also when we think of them as cultural differences, we all often think of them as like unchangeable, like immutable are actually responses to specific contexts and specific risks, including social risks. And, you know, a, a big element of social cohesion, uh, I don't think you mentioned it this at the beginning, but this is probably obvious to most, and you do discuss it in your work, is, is trust, right? Both interpersonal trust and trust of people toward political leaders, towards the government. High levels of distrust correlate with high levels of inequality, and Latin America is famous for having world's highest levels of inequality. And I'd venture that cultural differences are largely, not completely, but a big part of them are, driven, are products of material and institutional contexts within which individuals learn how to cope. Latin America compared to Europe. So comparing has higher inequalities, lower political accountability, weaker social services, what Andrew was talking about, and weaker social protections. Uh, and people have to respond to that. And like, for example, the important issue of trust that, you meant, that, that belongs to the to, to notion of is like kind of a glue of social cohesion. There are huge differences. If you look at public opinion surveys on trust in, let's say, Finland, where I grew up, versus Chile or Brazil, where I lived for a long time, my daughters are born in Brazil, to, you know, these countries that I've lived in, they we can measure huge differences in interpersonal trust and trust in government. In Finland, people trust the government, they trust each other. 
Um, but ultimately, it's based on enforceable contracts. People, you might take it so much for granted, you don't even realize it. But ultimately, I trust my neighbors because I know that ultimately, if puts come to shove, there is a law. There is, you know, uh, you can enforce contracts, and basically, also the state will take care of me, right? Uh, so I can even allow myself to distrust for that occasion that my neighbor doesn't deliver because I know that ultimately I won't be thrown out onto the street. Um, and and so I think institutions over time can foster that trust um, and so trust changes with institutional change and you know and so institutions culture culture is a product of institutions now the question is it easy to change not necessarily it's difficult um and sometimes you have policies that are hugely grandiose expect people to change their behavior quickly and can fail miserably. Um, but I do think that we can have a meaningful conversation about building, like, for example, if our topic is building so global social cohesion, like this panel, um, uh, you know, Andrew talked about basic social services. Uh, if you look at Latin America, especially if you go to, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, that's very ambitious. I mean, I think it's, I, 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 my own point of view is that there should be a basic social protection floor in transfers and services across the world. But maybe you can even start more modestly, like the policy proposal that we proposed, proposed with my co-authors is for a global universal basic income uh, guarantee for all the world's children at the extreme poverty level per child for every day of the year that could be administered you know that could be a global fund and if you build something like that i think you'd see a change in culture as well as a result of caregivers mothers often being able to have a basic level of income guaranteed and not focus on how they're going to feed their kids every day and be able to actually focus on other issues and 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 that could also change perceptions of trust so on and so forth and so yeah, I, I throw that out there. There's a lot there. So I think culture is a product of institutions largely. And I think that we need to build with pol meaningful policy proposals to build that institutional policy context to influence trust. Okay, very, uh, yes, very nice, uh, very comprehensive uh, answer, Marike. So we'll give Andrew later the chance to uh, answer these comments. But uh, let me now uh, switch again uh, the focus once more. And let me ask uh, Tommaso something about um, uh, global cooperation towards uh, taxation. So of course, if uh, we want to uh, think of a global system of social cohesion, a global safety net, we have to find ways to fund it. And uh, at the moment, of course, we don't have uh, anything like a, a global government, we have a global governance, but uh, of course uh, there have been significant steps forward in particular with the proposal uh, and with the accord uh, leading uh, to uh, this minimum income corporate tax uh, for next year if everything goes well. So I would like uh, to ask uh, Tommaso to give us an overview on where we are standing in terms of um, uh, global uh, cooperation towards uh, taxation. Thank you, Gianluca. The 2021 tax deal provides a good example of uh, potential uh, global tax cooperation, whether it worked, what we had to achieve or is trying to achieve. I think it's worth just going back to uh, what answer uh, it was trying to, what uh, question the deal was trying to answer. Uh, that was the, the global problem of uh, taxation or tax avoidance by multinational, which even the OECD, with a conservative estimate, estimated was around $240 billion um, a year of cost uh, missing revenue from, from governments to fund uh, the welfare state. Um, and this started in 2013 when the, the G20 mandated the OECD to tackle base erosion profit shifting, which is basically the ability of multinational to move profits from my tax jurisdiction, often where they had uh, their activities, their customers to, to tax haven through something that's called transfer pricing, the way they price the transaction uh, between each other. And uh, this, this ability by multinationals to, to shift profits also put pressure on countries to reduce the corporate tax rate. In the, in the US, we had rate in the 1980s around 45%, and that's fallen to um, 34% um, in the 2000, uh, and it stayed until this level until 2018, 2018 when Trump 
reduce corporation tax to 21%. And the OECD average fell from 28.6 to 28.1% in the two decades leading up to 2018. So this pressure, this ability of multinational just moving profits around uh, put pressure on different countries uh, to reduce corporate tax. Um, so this the, the, the G20 will mandate the OECD to come up with some solution to stop this. And eight, year, eight, eight years later, uh, they come out. They came out with two solutions. One was to, for the first time, to look at uh, multinationals as a, as a whole. So to look at the uh, them as unitary businesses. Something that is we as, uh, as the Equity Commission, the Venice Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation, have advocated for a long time. Um, to basically share some of these profits of the multinationals. Um, on the basis of a formula uh, based by sales, so to reallocate some of these profits to uh, the market jurisdiction. And the other uh, is the idea, which is um, uh, the, the, something that's like a potential social good, is that our minimum tax, uh, an effective minimum tax um, to, uh, to put an end to the, the so-called race to the bottom. Um, we have recreated, advocated for this minimum tax to be uh, ambitious at 25%. Ultimately, uh, this was agreed at fifteen percent, um, and um, uh, and so it is the first time that um, governments across the world come up to an agreement to introduce a minimum tax. Now, whilst this is in principle is a uh, is a positive uh, thing, uh, the deal itself, the way it's structured, does also reinforce existing uh, inequities. The the current rules are rules that have been set. In the 1920s, uh, at a time where we still have colonies, and by the power of the global north, and and these reallocation of taxing rights, which is happening through the through the minimum tax and through the solution to redistribute taxing rights for the for a small number of multinationals to the market jurisdiction, is expected actually to uh, deliver a deal that will favour again countries in the global north. So despite the, this work on multilateralism and these countries getting together, um, the deal in itself is, uh, is likely to reinforce existing inequities. Also, we need to look, well, whilst the, the deal is portrayed as a, as a, as a deal which has been uh, agreed by 140, uh, 141 countries, it is ultimately the deal of uh, the G7, which met in Cornwall uh, last summer to, um, to negotiate uh, and to agree of the uh, fifteen percent minimum tax, which will then was uh, rubber stamped by both then the G20 and the uh, OECD inclusive framework, one hundred forty one countries. Uh, we also need to 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 understand that uh, the a number of countries did not even participate in these negotiations. The Gulf of Africa did not even participate in the negotiation. So we, when we think of multilateralism, we also need to think: who, who are we talking about? Is this universal membership like that you have that you have at the UN, or is it some uh, institution? Uh, having said that, it is clear that some of the you know the drive uh, for for this reform was a number of very large economies pushing um, the demanding for this reform to, to take place to which was a reaction for part from to the public outcry demanding for a fairer taxation of um, of, of multinationals uh, so multilateralism uh, is is fragile uh, we've seen um, even in this negotiation that at one point the, the the reform was completely stalled because Trump did not want to agree. Uh, to the to to the reform, uh, then when Biden took over in the U.S. administration, they provide new um, uh, new support for to getting an agreement and finally reaching an agreement. Uh, but this agreement, uh, we need to consider that from from the perspective of both the, the global north and the global south. The current conflict um, uh, puts a question mark around whether uh, the, this agreement will be um, implemented. But it makes us, makes us all also understands how fragile multilateralism is. Okay, thank you, Thomas. So we will get back to that. Uh, so now let's go back to to Andrew. So yours uh, is uh, of course uh, a very strong proposal, very ambitious. And uh, so my immediate uh, reaction, uh, relying on my experience of uh, field work in uh, in Papua, is that uh, in Papua New Guinea is that there are. Uh, very nice looking uh, hospitals uh, built uh, with uh, Australian aid, but then doctors 
or teachers in this case, in the case of schools are missing. So I was wondering the extent to which in your notion of infrastructure that is of course, I absolutely agree topical should also be complemented with the formation in uh, uh, human capital. And that going back to what America was um, uh, proposing before. So maybe the idea of uh, handing out cash is a kind of uh, suboptimal uh, second best scenario uh, for a longer term um, period in which we can uh, really think of uh, forming both uh, um, infrastructure and uh, uh, human capital. And more generally in your uh, T7 Think7 policy brief, uh, you call for the need to connect, uh, to combine taxation with the social expenditure. So in the limited amount of time that we have left, uh, could you please try to touch upon uh, these uh, points thank you <laughs> some of those i i think what i'm going to do is is i want to highlight something that is uh that i think that i think is really important here um and the short version of that is that we in the advanced countries have been relying on certain processes uh for at least the last 50 years i think you go back 100 years um and we are effectively uh, not paying for the social protection that we deliver. We extract from the global commons, in, particularly in form of, of, of planetary costs that are now going to come to a reality. Um, particularly in the last 50 years, we've used finance to extract value um, from places as a way, as an alternative to funding our systems. And we have just straightforwardly transferred value from you know, whichever way you want to put it, from, from developing countries to advanced countries, from the south to the north. This is a long standing, I think those are uncontroversial positions, but it, it, what it leads to is, is a point. So it, it, in the advanced countries, we have two problems. One, we don't deliver enough protection to create the cohesion we say we're after and deliver on the economic productivity that we need from the human capital. And we're doing that at, without paying true cost today. So costs to deliver the social protection we're talking about in advanced countries have to go up substantially if we're going to be responsible. And the effect of that is that we're then not dragging resources out of other places. So, you know, is, is a kind of universal basic income, like it's a compensatory mechanism. How much more value would we actually be doing if we took responsibility for ourselves and didn't rely on extracting value out of those countries in the first place, um, rather than trying to put uh, money back. I don't know if I'm uh, being clear about that, but I think that there's a real imbalance. I think that that then has implications for taxation policy in uh, the advanced countries. If we want better social protection, we have to uh, increase the level that we're providing and we have to start paying real costs for it. That's going to mean a substantial increase in costs in advanced countries and that we are not going to get there without a much more uh, uh, reciprocal relationship between contribution and receipt of protection. Um, so that leads to more universal protections. And, and, and you know, I, we've done some work recently in the UK how, you know, you can simplify tax systems and you can connect uh, what people pay with universal access to healthcare and those kinds of things much more clearly than we are today. But I think really foundationally that the problem that we don't address is what we're not accepting. The peace dividend is going to go away. The climate, you know, we can't just exploit the climate anymore. If we're going to achieve global any levels of global social cohesion, we have to stop transferring value in the way that we are. Uh, those, those are the big problems and they are the responsibility of advanced countries to deal with internally. Uh, and I think unless we accept those responsibilities, then the, it, it's difficult to make any of the other solutions work. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, yes, Merike, yeah, maybe would, uh, you, you'd like to uh, react to, um, to what Andrew has just said, or uh, we can um, go on and uh, explore something more on uh, about your expertise. So you've done quite a lot of work on gender. And so I wanted uh, to ask you 
um, how you think that uh, yeah, social cohesion um, should uh, incorporate uh, and uh, try to address uh, the differences uh, uh, between gender that uh, we observe. But I leave you up to you how you, uh, you'd like to uh, proceed. Yeah, I mean, we could open up that big can of worms too, and I, I can say something, but I, I, I was just, um, uh, you know, motivated by Andrew's comments to, and I think it'd be interesting to have a discussion on this issue. I, I mean, there's nothing that what you say I disagree with at all. I'm just wondering, uh, for example, like this, okay, universal basic services, I think it would be wonderful to have something like that. And I totally agree that, you know, the deal right now is totally unfair. Um, uh, however, if I think about like political feasibility, especially on the global level, so moving away from the national level and thinking also about the political and electoral, like, you know, uh, you know it, it's kind of a hard sell to say, you know, we need to just uh, like immediately. And so when I think of these things, I, I think of them as, can it kind of totally being mutually complementary and no way mutually exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. The one thing I would disagree with, you know, you mentioned, or not disagree, you mentioned like, okay, something like, a, let's say a universal basic income or universal basic income for children, like even more sort of targeted is compensatory. But I think it's also kind of a, a mechanism to liberate and empower people that is not just entirely compensatory because until people can guarantee some basic needs and until like, you know, parents can feed their kids, they're not gonna like, honestly, like, those are the stepping tones also for creating a more cohesive society and a more empowered society by meeting certain basic needs and given the current conditions that exist in many countries that we know that cash transfers are a relatively speedy effective and efficient and not that complicated way to economically empower people right it's also it's less subject to potential instances of corruption and mismanagement like all these things that when you get into the devil is in the details show up and so i i don't see these two in any way as mutually exclusive if you had this kind of basic social protection foreign transfers that's also a much better um context from which to build a sort of effective demand for better services as well like our mm -hmm. approach and so that i can also say some things about gender um what was it again uh, <laughs> but I, I if somebody else wants to jump jump in i i, I don't want to like monopolize the conversation Okay, maybe we will uh, we'll leave that for, for, for later for the final round of remarks. I've already seen that there is a question in the chat, so feel free to ask questions in the chat and we'll try to address them at the end. So let me now turn to uh, Tommaso. And uh, yeah, so we have heard from Andrew that, uh, yes, uh, we are in a way living above uh, our uh, possibilities mm -hmm. uh, to some extent. Uh, and so finding ways uh, to fund uh, our social systems uh, of assistance, uh, also in the light uh, of uh, uh, climate change and the awareness that we are exhausting our natural resources becomes uh, more and more important. So many um, scholars have talked uh, about uh, uh, a wealth tax. And actually, if you look at the surveys, uh, there is uh, some of the highest level of uh, public acceptance uh, uh, is uh, precisely on wealth tax. So can you give us a, a perspective on uh, the possibility of a wealth tax? And again, not so much only at the national level, of course, in some countries we already have wealth taxes. But again, do, do, do you think that there is a, uh, the concrete possibility of having some coordination on something going closer to a global wealth tax and maybe the war in Ukraine could also give us uh, an opportunity to explore more the possibility really of uh, going uh, and targeting um, wealthy people around the world as an effect of uh, the need to identify um, people for sanctions uh, in the Ukraine war. Thank you, Gianluca. So the the pandemic, the, the energy crisis, they, they, they've all exacerbated existing inequality and it is clear that there is new momentum, particular public support for taxation 
or, or the extremely wealthy. We've seen uh, Biden announcement that the weekend they want to introduce a, a minimum tax for billionaires. Um, so I think taxation of wealth today is a national issue. So sovereign, sovereign rights of countries to introduce a, a wealth tax. I think this is constrained though by the global uh, financial architecture where you have tax havens and therefore the ability to um, put money, uh, uh, hide money in uh, offshore. I think the estimates is that almost nearly 10% of global GDP can be held, uh, is, is held offshore. Um, but as you said, the, the, the current conflict perhaps provide a window opportunity to, 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 to close some of the loopholes that are, uh, allow often very rich individuals to, to move assets offshore. Um, so the, the, the new, uh, the, or the, the, the plans to try and identify oligarchs assets have, uh, have renewed the call for more transparency on tax havens. Um, and this um, requires um, the creation of registers uh, with uh, public information on where these assets are ever who owns them. Uh, we've seen our, like in, um, in the UK, the demand for, for register of, uh, of assets or, or UK assets held through offshore companies, um, the creation of register to have this data, which is currently not available, was a, it was a commitment made by the government in 2016, uh, but then it just remained a commitment until the Ukraine-Russia conflict. So I think there is an opportunity for, uh, for, for governments to push through more ambitious reform in the next few months to, to make to make m m m much of this wealth uh, more transparent and so that allow both to to deal with issues around illicit financial flows our um, uh, resources taken from countries particularly in the global south are are transferred to 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 tax havens in the global north but also to consider uh, uh, the 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 use of uh, wealth taxation now the question around um, wealth taxation at a global level, I think that uh, will require a discussion about institutions that could um, um, administer such such a tax. I think there there is potentially uh, more uh, room for uh, such a measure at regional level, for example, at the European Union level. But I think this uh, any any measure of to to tax wealth at the moment is all of extreme extreme wealth is is uh, restricted by the ability to locate where this wealth is. Uh, we've seen previous crises, like the 2008 crisis, gave rise and momentum to automatic exchange information. So we actually know where the offshore um, bank accounts of, of uh, tax residents are. Um, but there are there are different forms of wealth, uh, different assets, uh, shares, mm -hmm. which we're not able to trace. And so we need more transparency to, to them being able to, to ensure that creating tax on wealth is actually done in an effective way. And that will also require enforcement, so more resources uh, for governments to actually uh, ensure that these rules are implemented. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tommaso. So I would like to uh, pick up on a, on a question uh, from the audience, from uh, Robert Schramm. Um, so Robert uh, says that uh, UBI can be a great stepping stone, but overall he seems more um, in favor of um, um, universal basic services, uh, provision of universal basic services. And then uh, he makes this interesting proposal. So he says um, to uh, comment uh, on, the, uh, on the proposal of having a UBI coupled with uh, a shorter work week, of, work week of about 20 hours as a stepping stone towards uh, yeah, greater social protection. So I, I would like to give Andrew and Merrick the opportunity to continue uh, their interesting exchange on uh, different ways to uh, provide the social protection, maybe starting from this um, proposal by Robert. Thank you. I, I, um, th there, there are a lot of ways of approaching this, and I completely accept that the concept of universal basic services suggests an investment over time to build up an infrastructure, as you were saying, Jim, Luca, it's not just physical, it's also human resources. It's, a, it's, a, it's an investment over a period of time, and cash injections and transfers can have much more immediate effect um, 
And that particularly comes into contrast when you when you're looking at the more developed countries, which always have which already have quite substantial public service infrastructures in place. And we're talking about making improvements or marginal adjustments where uh, compared to countries where maybe those services don't exist and you're talking about building them up from the bottom. Um, there has been some research and I think we need to be careful about creating guaranteed income streams for people who are who don't have access to the universal basic services at all, because they have been seen to then use those as a, as a finance mechanism to get access to the public services and then get themselves involved in a kind of debt, uh, a debt economy. Um, and I think, you know, to pick up on the tax havens point, what a great example of, you know, we, who, who runs the tax havens? It's those of us in the advanced countries, right? Britain, classically one of the big providers of this, uh, and uh, America right up there, Holland, et cetera. So while we're running these systems, a lot of that money, that if that 10% of global GDP exists in those tax havens, where does it come from? I mean, a lot of it's been extracted from the global south, the non-advanced countries, and it's being stored there because it's in our advantage. I'm, I'm, so I'm not advocating against, I think, you know, shorter working week uh, uh, could well be something we're experimenting various companies in the UK with it uh, this year. Uh, cash transfers have their role. Uh, universal basic services are a, an idea amongst this. But I do think that, that, that until we in the advanced countries take more responsibility for meeting our own costs out of our own resources and not living above our means at the expense of the rest of the planet, we're going to be compensated. You know, that's what I mean by compensatory. We're sort of trying to make up for damage we've caused by creating uh, additional value. We, you know, if we don't take care of the damage piece, which I think is much bigger than we than we will uh, normally accept, then these other mechanisms are not going to be sufficient to make up for that. That would be what I would say. Thank you, Andrew. America, would you like to uh, reply to Andrew and to the proposal from the audience? I mean, I, I, with Andrew, I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything. My question is just how do you go about it in terms of practical policy steps and policy feasibility? Like what to do next? Like, I don't, I don't disagree at all that advanced industrialized countries should uh, basically pay for more of the effects of irresponsible behavior, you know, like pollution, all the kind of climate stuff. I'm just thinking like moving forward in immediate practical terms, how do you go about translating all these, um, like this analysis into sort of feasible policy um, proposal? Yeah, it's, a, it's a political issue, but the, I, I mean, I think where it comes back down to is tax is that we need some tax reform in advanced countries that tax agree, all incomes the same, right? Flat income definition, progressive rates. So income from wealth, income from uh, work, wages should all be taxed the same. I think that's where the kind of, that's where you start is with a reform tax. Yeah, and I think that applies to many developing countries too. Like oh, now we're looking at kind of this north south north south issue, but if you look at many developing countries, you also have elites that actually <laughs> send their money yeah. abroad. And and I yeah. think <clears throat> the like in in each country, like a basic state state infrastructure, state capacity and political accountability has to be fostered. Uh, so it's not just the North South thing, but like, you know, if you look at Latin American countries, a huge problem is that the elites don't pay enough taxes with the possible right. potential, partial exception of Brazil that has a more a higher tax burden, but then it's extremely complicated and people evade and it's not like a streamlined, healthy system. Um, uh, or, you know, Brazilians will say, well, we pay first world taxes and get third world services. <laughs> like that's a saying that Brazilians have. You know, and, and, and so I, I think that all these dilemmas also need to be very much had on a national level. It's a global issue, but also a national level because like, yeah. okay, let's say, okay, well, well it, uh, we're responsible for everything. Well, actually each domestic political system locally is also responsible for being more accountable and building those basic public services. Couldn't agree more. I see questions here. I, you know, I, I don't want to yes. talk more if there's people in the audience who have something much more interesting to say. Uh, yes, yeah, so th there is an interesting question from uh, Grisel MC. I don't know if uh, he or she wants to ask this question 
herself or himself, but I think uh, it's uh, maybe a question for Tommaso. So what are your views on applying the polluter pays principle to the financial services? I don't know if uh, Grisel is available yeah. maybe to give more clarifications. Grisel, if, if, if you can elaborate on what that means in, in practice. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and to exchange with you. So um, the, um, I, the question is about, yes, uh, addressing um, inequalities um, since there are, since 10% of the world's population hold 82% of wealth, uh, of global wealth, and the bottom 50% share only 1% of total wealth. And uh, moreover, the wealthiest 1% drive twice the carbon emissions of the poorest mm -hmm. half of the world combined population. So um, there are uh, several initiatives um, aiming to uh, implement this polluters pay principle since um, actually most of these uh, emissions caused by the 1% wealthiest are related to their financial assets, actually. Thank you, Grace. So I think, so I think ultimately, uh, which is also the point that uh, others were making, this is about the social cohesion and, and a belief in the social contract. To have belief in the social contract, you need to think that everybody is paying their fair share, that everybody is contributing. And at the moment, um, as, as mentioned, there's, there's, there's some form of wealth that are untaxed, uh, some form of wealth that tax the preferential rates compared to labor. And so to address uh, some of these issues, you, you need to, to have progress, more progressive taxation and governments are going to uh, have, you know, they're facing multiple crises from the, the energy crisis, the climate crisis, the pandemic, now the, this, uh, this conflict and um, increased need for uh, resources, uh, which is particularly uh, in the global south, a number of countries are, uh, have a risk of debt default, uh, the need for domestic uh, resource mobilization is really high. A number of countries have um, tax to GDP that is not is below twenty percent, which is the minimum level to be able to actually to provide uh, minimal uh, minimal level of services. So I think uh, going back to your point about um, polluting, I think the it is clear that the the one percent is as a disproportionate amount of is responsible for those proportionate amount of emissions. And therefore, the, uh, this further reinforces the need for um, more more progressive taxation. Um, I think there is more public support for this than ever before. There's also the pressing need for revenues. I think governments ultimately, the near revenues will use also use this as an excuse to raise taxes. And we'll, we'll, so I think there is there are policy solutions now that are there. Um, don't look as, as radical as they would have done uh, five or ten years ago. So I think you know we have to be optimistic also because there is just the need to raise more revenues and uh, there's no free lunch. And uh, so I think the, the ultimately uh, the, the revenue will have to, to increase. Question is how is this distributed? And the, the more this is distributed, distributed fairly, the more this will re reinforce uh, trust in, in society. Okay, thank you, Tomaso. So there was a, another very interesting question by uh, Dritman Das. Uh, in the chat, but uh, I'm afraid that we have uh, to wrap up uh, the session now. So I would advise uh, Drit Dritiman, sorry for the uh, wrong pronunciation, to read the, the extensive work by Merike and also by Andrew on the topic on basically how to foster social cohesion in developing countries. And uh, I hope you can be contented with that. So let me go back to a final round of questions. So I, I suppose, uh, uh, a nice way to end uh, a session of this type would be to have uh, a nice optimistic message like uh, build back better, etc. But instead, uh, let me ask you, I would say, a, a question based on a, 
rather pessimistic view over the future. So I was uh, really intrigued by Andrew's perspective uh, of uh, basically having exhausted also natural, natural resources. And so my question is uh, also dealing on some work uh, in uh, climate change studies uh, and in the so-called carbon budget approach that says that basically we have, we, we, we are in a situation in which uh, rich countries uh, have uh, a negative carbon budget. So the, 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 there would be no possibility to further, uh, you know, go on with our standard of living, emitting uh, CO two. But actually, we have to go to 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 think uh, in a completely different perspective, in which uh, we have to just uh, basically start uh, reducing and uh, go back in in a region of negative emissions. So we are. I think uh, we will be more and more faced with this uh, necessity really to uh, deal with this uh, more and more binding uh, constraint on uh, the amount of uh, natural resources that uh, we can make. And this, of course, uh, is going to have a potentially dramatic uh, consequences on our very notion of a social cohesion because uh, it's uh, uh, in a way, um, uh, nice to think of how to divide a cake that is expanding, but then it's a completely different matter to think of how to divide a, a cake that is shrinking. So I would like uh, the panelists to give uh, a very final uh, remark on uh, uh, how social cohesion, uh, let alone global social cohesion, could look like in a context in which our resources are shrinking rather than expanding. And maybe we can follow the same uh, order with uh, Andrew first, then Mary can finally Tommaso. Um. I mean, I think that points to the, the there's a really central challenge here. And in some ways, I see the war in Ukraine and what it's done to energy and resource prices as a little bit of a dry run for what we are going to see more of as we go for, further into the uh, climate issue and the energy um, transition. So, you know, what has been the response of government so far? Um, I, I'm sitting in California, the governor says he's going to give everybody with a car $400 to make up for the cost of increased gas. It's, we, we, we really have a very serious challenge and I, and I think that there's just a lot of political work to do to get uh, um, people to a point where they are willing to even kind of wrap their heads around the idea that the resources are not as available and we are going to have to have probably a little less of them live more efficient lives. I think that applies on a personal level, but frankly, there's too much emphasis on this kind of, oh, it's your personal responsibility for this climate problem. You, you need to fix it with your personal carbon footprint. Um, there's not enough responsibility at the government level, and that's where it applies. So I, I know, you know, it, it is a great idea to talk about global stuff, but the reality today is that most of the money is raised at a national level. That's where the crisis is, is got to be tackled uh, in reality. If we you know, if we think of the next 10 or 20 years, um, I think that uh, we should continue to push for global uh, solidarity and funding uh, around a lot of these issues. Um, but we're going to have to uh, take this on at a, at a, at a national level, particularly. Um, so I, I think I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Merike, would you like to go next? Yeah, very quickly. I mean, who knows? I mean, the world is so unpredictable. I don't know what it's going to look like in, in half a year. It's interesting from where we sit. And Andrew mentioned that thing about the, you know, getting more money for in a car. I, I totally agree, by the way, on this issue that you can't just rely on individual consumers and this kind of blah, blah, blah. It's very much a government issue. It's a very much you have to have some top down initiatives that simply tax now, on a national or a global level. I see this comment by Eva Hamstangel. I'm sorry if I mangled your name, but yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. You need these kinds of global and national taxes in order to fund some basic initiatives related to climate change related to SDGs, related to redistributing inequality. Standing, sitting here in Hamburg and with the impact of like the terrible crisis in Ukraine, I do feel a, a very strong sense of like solidaristic uh, reaction by many countries and like high levels of social consensus that to me makes me think that sometimes you have these moments of where crises bring windows of opportunity to push for 
more meaningful change on issues like, and you know, I, will, I was just listening to the speech by Oval of Schultz said, you know, we're going to give 300 million euros to the global fight against hunger that will inevitably particularly affect the MENA region in sub-Saharan Africa as a result of the fact that Ukraine and Russia produce so much wheat. I mean, these are like the, that kind of collateral damage we're not even really factoring in yet as visibly, but like if we can link that to some kind of a more sustainable initiative than just like a one-time transfer of funds to the World Food Program and think about mm -hmm. these I would like to be an optimist in a, in a, in a situation that is, um, you know, really crisis ridden. But I do see that it has to come from this kind of a top down initiatives. We need the global leaders, you know, Schultz and Biden, et cetera, to push this stuff through. Yes, thank you. Thank change. you. Yeah, thank you, Merke. We are already over time. Uh, so I'd like to give the final word to Tommaso very, very briefly. Uh, so you've seen that there are a lot of comments asking for yeah, social justice around the world. So do you think that there is going to be more pressure and uh, also more uh, public demand uh, on uh, taxing the super rich uh, on the top of that? Well, I think, I mean, the, the, the last um, round of comments, we all kind of probably refer to the pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. I think we have to remain positive. I think it shows that things change very quickly. Um, government seems to be able to find lots of resources uh, overnight. Uh, and the question is, what, what are these resources for? And uh, can they collectively come together and agree uh, as world leaders that which are the major challenges that we have and put the, the money where their mouth is. Uh, I think we've seen in, with the COP26, uh, lack of ambitious, lack of uh, funding for the global south. All of a sudden there is fund, there's a lot of money being invested in arms. Uh, yeah. Can we find similar, it seems that where there is a will to get resources, um, we can find it, um, and um, you know if we can, if we if we want it, we can afford it. Somebody else said before. So. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, and also to the audience for posing uh, great questions. I hope we have uh, offered uh, an overview of uh, social cohesion and global social cohesion and the perspective for global taxation. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you soon, somehow in person, in the near future. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.